Hi, I'm Piers from Raycom, and I'm delighted to be joined once again by Jack from Sure. What are we talking about today? Piers, about two months ago, I phoned you while I was walking across London Bridge, having had a very confusing meeting about multi-zone antenna combining. And you were very kind at giving me a lot of information about some of the products that Wizicom make and, and Raycom distribute and I thought this was worth doing a video over because it integrates really nicely with our Accident Digital and ULXD product. So we're here to talk about multi-zone antenna combining and we had a little catch up at the start of the day about who this video is for and we came up with some interesting ideas. Who do you think this video is for, Piers? Well, anywhere where a single pair of antennas is not going to cut the mustard and that is increasingly everywhere really, like where, where you've got uh, multi-spaces in a, in a corporate office for instance where you might have a number of meeting spaces or offices, a theatre, and you might want to be able to go with any microphone to any of those spaces and, and be heard. Likewise on film sets so, uh, or reality TV, you might have sets with upstairs, downstairs, cellar, garage, you know, and you want coverage in all those areas and that's where multiple zone antennas is gonna come to its own. Having had our discussion this morning, and looking at my inbox and seeing how many inquiries there are from various different places, I think this video is for a lot of people now. I think more than one antenna position on big award shows, big corporates, things of that nature, it's becoming an absolute must in a lot of these big installations. And it's quite challenging, isn't it? There's a lot of stuff that we need to bear in mind. What are some of the challenges involved in adding extra antennas into a system? Why can't I just bang another pair in and, and get on with my life? Well, um, in a single antenna zone situation, all you've really got to worry about is the performance of the antenna and the receiver and normally a bit of coax cable between them, which is pretty transparent, to be honest. As soon as you start combining zones, you're introducing more circuitry. And when you combine, you lose signal, you lose power, and you need to compensate for that. So you're having to put potentially non-linear circuitry in the way in the form of amplifiers. And so if, you're, if you've got, say, a four, eight zone system, you've got four aerials looking at four areas, each one of those picking up an aggregate of power of all of the RF in that particular zone, combining it all together, thus potentially putting stress on the amplifiers, which could become nonlinear and uh, causing intermods, or just overloading the receiver. So good gain structure, good filtering, and above all, very, very good design in the amplification stages of the combiner is really, really important. Okay, so let's break that down a bit. If we've got, as an example, when we talk about a zone, we're talking about an area that has to have a set of microphones and antennas in them. And if we're talking about one zone, we're talking about one rack of kit, one set of antennas, some people in the room, like we're doing now, right? We've both got wireless microphones, there's a set of antennas somewhere. We are in one zone, we're in one studio. Examples of multiple zones could be, I guess, another studio, right? Where the rack kit is stored in one area, and the rack room feeds both studios, that would become a whole separate RF zone where there's different stuff going on. That's kind of correct, right? Yep, that's right. Yeah. And then that can grow and grow and grow. I mean, you could have, uh, I've put in systems where you've got a, a TV studio or two TV studios in the basement for a large corporate, then they want, of coverage all over the floor, the, the trading floors or the sales floors or whatever it is, depending on the type of, of business involved. And, and it's possible to do that with multiple zones without having to have separate receivers for each zone and to literally pick up a mic and be in one space and then go up seven floors and be broadcasting again. So on paper, super easy. Rack kit in one room, it's shared amongst multiple spaces in an area. But as you add more antennas, so as you add an extra pair of antennas for your diversity, we are listening to much more of the RF coming in, aren't we? And we were saying this morning, body pack transmitters, handheld transmitters, they're the things you want. They're relatively low power, but we obviously share the spectrum with lots of other sources that could be much higher power, right? Absolutely. And I mean, when, when I design a multi-zone system, I, t I pay particular attention to what's going to be in the zones, what, what other signals might be present. I mean, I've had situations where we've had people with five watt walkie-talkies that are very, very close to the frequency band we're trying to pick up for wireless. So again, making sure that the equipment has the correct headroom while still being able to listen right down to the noise floor and use filtering as well where, wherever possible, just to try and ensure the chances of interference or overload are reduced. I mean, even, even if you haven't got other sources of, of interference coming in there, you could have a situation where you've got multiple zones and in zone one, say, you've, that's the big studio and it's really, really big. You've got several people with wireless mics that are 
tens of meters away from the receiver antennas, and then you've got Studio 6 you know, in the basement, for instance, and the antennas may be only just a few meters, a couple of meters away from somebody wearing a transmitter, and so that transmitter then becomes a really high signal level mixed in with the really low signal levels. You want to make sure that that, that high level doesn't affect the low level signals. So as ever, we're talking about gain structure, aren't we? We're talking yes. about trying to get everything that's in your venue hitting that one rack of kit to a similar level of gain that's coming into the system. We mentioned walkie-talkies, that's a big one, keying up at five watts. What other sources would we see in a multi-zone environment that would become an issue to us that we would need to consider? Well, mobile phones, mobile phone base stations. You, some, some places that I've worked in have had internal mobile phone base stations, albeit relatively low power for, for, for coverage. DTV, I mean, you, you might be putting a system in no, cl close to a, a DTV transmitter or up at Crystal Palace or something with 100 kilowatts of, of, of DTV coming in on the next channel. These are all things that need to be considered, especially when, as is often the case, we, we install antennas in outside areas as well, like on, on in the roof garden of, a, of, a, of a, an office block or something. And that's where you need to watch out for incoming interference from all sorts of sources. And the math is pretty complicated, isn't it? So you were trying to explain to me this morning, and my slightly dumb brain was, was not really getting the math side, but if you get the signal, the same signal coming in on two sets of antennas, it's not just a doubling of the signal, is that right? Where it increases exponentially. There are a number of, a number of factors. Obviously, we, we were talking about gain structure. Grain, gain structure is really, really important. Headroom of the amplifier is important to, to actually be able to handle all of these aggregated RF levels. Noise floor is really, really important because you don't want to mess up the noise floor. The whole thing is a massive balancing act of, of all these and other factors. But yes, the, 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 the point you're referring to is, is specifically when you have multiple signals being received through a common amplifier, as you've got in, in a multi-zone system, the, the power that you need to handle multiple signals actually increases by the square of the number of channels you've got. That assumes you've got the same level on all channels, but obviously in a multi-zone system it's very unpredictable, so you need to, to predict for worst case. I mean, a very specific example I'd give you, if you, for instance, wanted to amplify eight one watt signals, you would need an amplifier that's capable of handling the, the square of those number of amplifiers. So 64 watts of power you would need in the amplifier just to be able to linearly amplify your, your eight signals at one watt. So this sounds like it's getting quite complicated. I think we need a whiteboard to see some of this stuff. Pull this in, don't knock the light no. over again. No genies appearing this time. Then. Sketch out for me, if you will, a simple circuit diagram for what a multi-zone system would look like, the amplifiers we've got to consider, the losses that we have con to consider, what's, what's involved in this, in this complex okay. picture. Well, I'd, I'll do my best. My father was an artist, but sadly didn't rub off on me. Uh, but say, so you've got an antenna here, you've got an antenna there. There's, we've got two zones, nothing very exciting. So what you've got at the antenna is an amplifier. You've then got feeder coax, which could be any length. Same here. And then you've got two-way combiner, two-way combiner. Now what you need to do is have another amplifier ahead there, and I'll explain why in a minute. And that's your output to your receiver. So, what the first thing we've got is the, we've got the antenna, we've then got some feeder, and that feeder, let's say in this instance, let's say it's 100 meters long of LMR400 at UHF, about 10 dB of loss. We need to put 10 dB in here to get rid of that loss, effectively to, to, to compensate for that loss before it's happened. Why, you might ask, not put 10 dB in there? Well, the reason for that is you'd be amplifying the thermal noise in the cable. So you'd be destroying the noise floor by 10 dB, which is very significant. 10 dB in power terms is like 10 times the power. So you'd be losing, you'd, be, you'd have 10% of the power effectively. Uh, at the other end relative to noise. So you, you amplify your 10 dB there, then you've got a two-way combiner. Now the laws of physics say that if you're combining two signals like this, you're throwing away half the power. In the same way as if you were using it as a splitter, if you put a, say a watt in that way, if you got a watt out of both, you'd be throwing the laws of physics away. It's just not possible. Conservation of energy and all that. So it stands to reason you're losing half the power here where you're combining, which is 3 dB. So you need 3 dB here. And again, why not put the amplification there? Same thing again, you've got 3 dB loss there, you'd be throwing away 3, 3 dB of noise floor if you did that. So it, gain structure is really, really important. Then you've got to consider somebody with a walkie-talkie. Like walkie-talkie? <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> put a little circle on the top there, there you go. Little circle. Oh, lovely. A little <laughs> person talking into it. Wonderful, but, yes. <laughs> so five watts there, that, 
is going to in, in, induce, if it's relatively close, a very, very, very high level there which might be from five watts, you know, you might have a signal, a, a level of maybe 10, 10 milliwatts or 100 milliwatts going in there. So that's 100 milliwatts is 20 dBm. And yet the threshold of your wonderful share accent receivers is about m minus 110. So from 20 dBm there, you need to see down to 110 dBm. So that's a difference of 130 dB. So effectively, the dynamic range of this whole system needs to be 130. So the headroom of this amplifier needs to match the headroom of that amplifier, as does the noise floor. And if you ran too much gain here, you'd, you'd then effectively be overloading this amplifier before this one overloaded. So you'd have messed up the gain structure and you'd be throwing away dynamic range. So this whole thing is a very, very important balance and it's really, really important to make sure that the equipment that's used to do, perform this task is up to the job. And I've, I, you know, in my career, I've had some very, very hairy moments where I thought whole installations were gonna fall down just because somebody chose the wrong place to rock up with a walkie-talkie. And this is very common. Every site that I work on now has walkie-talkies all over it. And this is quite a complex picture. And the goal that we're trying to do here from what you've said is it, it's about gain structure and maintaining balance across the whole system, right? So my brain looks at this and goes, even in a two zone, so this is just two, I mean, we work on stuff that is as, as high as eight zones, or I know you've done stuff that's many more than eight zones as well. The maths involved in trying to get this right and consistent across all those zones is, is pretty powerful and pretty complex. What I love about some of the products that we're talking about, and we're gonna get onto those now, is it simplifies all of this down and does a lot of it for you. So let's talk about the tools that we have access to. We've got some of them on the table here that help us try and make this picture as easy and reliable as possible without having to get involved in the weeds of all the maths. Yeah, well, a good place to start, I suppose, is the Wizicom LFA antenna. This is a, a, an antenna shark fin type, as most people refer to it. Actually, a, a, the, the official title is a log period, periodic dipole array. And it has a very wide band because it's log periodic. It, uh, it works from like 400 to 1.2 gigs, so it covers UHF, walkie-talkie frequencies all the way up to DME. And it, it also has, so, so that's the antenna bit here, it's also got the amplifier bit, but even before the amplifier, it's got a filter that you can tune, which is another sort of tool to have in your toolkit to avoid the sort of overload from out-of-band signals like walkie-talkies, mobile phones that we discussed. Actually, we could, by adding a filter into the antenna, get rid of our walkie-talkie system completely. Yes. From our, from our yes, the, the filter is effectively before the amplifier as well, so it stops it even before it can get to anything that can overload. So the filter in there, you can tune to make sure it lets through what you want to, to, to get through and works as hard as possible to reject things you don't want. You, as I say, you've got the amplifier then, which you set exactly to the loss you need to make up for the cable. It then goes into a combiner. In this case, we've got a Wizicom Mat 244. This is a four zone diversity combiner. So it's got eight inputs. So it's got two, two antennas in each zone. There's also an eight way as well for larger systems. Uh, and then the output of that will feed into the to the receivers um, that you've got there. And this box handles the amplification on this side of the equation. So after we've amplified for the loss of the cable, it will then amplify for the loss in the combiner. And then we do, do we need to worry about the amplification out to the receiver as well, or is that? No, no, that that, that actually was was an example of what not to do. You so don't we can put, get rid of the amplifier that. after the loss. Again, each input, in this case, we've got, well, we've got eight, eight inputs, four, four diversity inputs. There's eight amplifiers and each one of those you can adjust the gain on. And I mean, that's another really, really interesting point because you, you might get situations. I mean, I had a situation in a very, very big TV reality show where you had celebrities spread out over, um, it was actually about a million square feet. And sometimes they would congregate in a little room to talk to the producers. And in the little room, they were about two or three meters from the antennas at most. So the, the signal they were producing in those antennas was much, much stronger than when they were out and about on the large set. And you, but you might have somebody on their own or a couple of people in this small room and you'd still have loads of very weak signals of people walking around outside. So what you could do there is actually reduce the gain on that particular zone knowing that you don't need the sensitive. You can throw away a lot of noise floor in the interest of avoiding high level signals that could cause intermods on much weaker signals. So that's, that's something you can do on each individual input. Not to mention the fact the amplifiers are designed to have power handling into the watts almost to, to, to be able to pick up lots and lots of weak signals. But by the time you've got more than 
a handful of weak signals, they can all aggregate into something quite significant that can cause problems. Cool, so we know that this product works really well with, with analog systems like Wizicom systems. Obviously we're here today as Shaw. Why uh, are we here? What does this and Axiom Digital do together that is really, really cool? Well, that, I mean, that's another very interesting question. Another really, really good reason to make sure you use the best equipment in terms of uh, for distribution. Basically, the analog systems that, that you refer to are, they use FM very much like a, an FM radio in a car. And not that there's much of it around these days, but the other sort of broadcast radio system you tune into is AM, which is amplitude modulation. So you've got amplitude and frequency modulation. Now the digital system in the Axiom uses a very, very clever modulation scheme that is a combination of amplitude and frequency. In fact, it's phase, but effectively you need to preserve the exact relationship of the, uh, uh, the, the phase of the modulation in both amplitude and phase domains. And if that gets messed up, it causes a lot of dropouts and loss of sensitivity, uh, loss, just audio dropouts. So preserving that, so you need a very, very linear signal. And then again, if you've got an overloaded amplifier, it's going to be compressing that amplitude modulation and the, the accent's gonna be struggling even with its error correction to, to resolve it. So this equipment is completely transparent to, to that digital modulation, unlike some, some other products that I've, I've seen on the workbench. So this is why they do work very nicely in concert with each other. And it's interesting, it addresses that last need that's in my head, which is if you're gonna deploy this system, you've gotta know that it's gonna work and it has to be reliable. And our system really likes linearity across its antenna network and that's very much what this provides. So if you are working on a complex production or a complex installation with multiple zones and you're putting this stuff in, you can deploy this and know that all of the components are working in harmony with each other to get the best out of everything. That's right, yeah. Excellent. Well, thanks Piers, really appreciate running through those, those points and hopefully simplifying this maths down to an offering, like the product that this delivers us. If you're working on something that is very complex, we've spoken about some of them, award shows, location sound. The big one for me at the moment that's, that's filling up my inbox is those corporate installations where you've got people that, that wanna be able to use one set of mics all over the place. This set of equipment is, is a really good option in it, and it will give you something that's relatively simple to solve a relatively complex challenge and give you a lot of reliability in the system. Absolutely. And I, I should say, you can, you can do pretty much the same thing with IEMs as well, but there's a subject for a video in the future. Well, we'll come back to talk to you about that one, Pierce. Um, thanks so much for having me along. Really, really good to come back and do these again. Thank you.